What is up YouTube? We are back for part two of this tutorial about doing interesting things within NeoVim, particularly around saving and doing other business auto magically. Uh, this video is back because we got the thumbs up. There were enough thumbs up on the last video. Uh, as it turns out you want to see more like this. So we're going to go get right to that at some point during this video. I will be giving you a sneak peek of what is possible in part three, but I'm thinking we got to raise the bar a little bit. Let's put it up to, let's say, 2K likes this time and see if you can make it. I think you'll be interested. Anyways, let's get to where we're going. Picking up where we left off last time, we have an auto command that runs when a file is written. We make sure that it's in a group so that we don't add infinite of them. We're currently running them for any go file and then we call this callback one small modification i made just to show that this is uh, all a real programming language that you can extend with real programming ideas since we had copy and pasted code between standard out and standard error we can actually declare a local function and then just pass that to both of these and then we'll write that data out into this buffer so when we go ahead and save this buffer you'll see once again that we now have this that's where we were last time. If you don't know what's going on, you'll need to watch the previous video, which I will link below. But what we're going to do in this video is we're going to work on how could you make this somewhat of a dynamic or extensible thing that you could easily replicate the setup for different languages or different scenarios and just do this super easily. So we're going to break this down into a few different parts. The first part is we're going to figure out how can we write sort of a function that just does exactly what we see here. Secondly, how can we connect that function to user commands, which are custom commands that you can run so that you can have completion or other things like that happening. And then finally, how can we easily enable and disable and choose which buffers to listen to? Once we've completed that, we'll be able to combine all the pieces together and you'll be able to basically run any of these commands automatically on save and have them fill into a buffer. You could easily extend this to do things like put floating windows, do more complicated things than just doing the output. That's what I'm gonna show you as the hint for part three. So I've moved us over just so that we can see the full screen of only the Lua code. This should allow us a few more lines of real estate in the video. And we'll go hop back and forth between the go file and here as we wanna test things. The first thing that you might notice, we already have a few variables that are sort of passed throughout this auto command. And so if we wanted to, we could essentially just declare a new function here, something like local attach to buffer. What this could take is a buff number, and we'll call it output buff number for now, and a command. And when we run this, you'll see, hey, it tells us that we can call this function now, and we can just call this with 34 and go run main.go just like we had before right and we can sort of delete these two things so now we've pulled this idea into one function there's one more thing that we're going to need to do which is also the pattern so why don't we go ahead and put pattern here and we'll put pattern right here as well so that when we're using this function we're able to easily parameterize whatever we're interested in doing i think you can probably see where this is going to be going after we've saved and executed this file we can go back to our main.go and we can indeed write this and see that our auto commands are still working if you want i can go ahead and put something like Let's go ahead and drop a new thing in here, which says testing, just to prove that this is what's going on. When we write this, you'll see the new testing's coming up. As I mentioned, for part two, we're gonna figure out how can we make commands, which allow us to easily interact with them and call other function. So what you need to know is nbim create user command. This allows us to create a new command that can be triggered by typing something. So for example, when you type colon, you're able to see that there are a bunch of commands already. For example, telescope, which we all know and love. We can type this, we're able to get completion and then run that command, which will call some Lua or Vim script code in the background and execute them. This just allows you to easily do this without creating new key maps for everything. That's kind of what we're gonna start with here. So we might have something like call this auto run, right? And what we're going to pass into this function, we can find out by reading the friendly manual. So in the help here, it tells us that we need to give it a name. 
and then we need to give it a command, which is the thing to execute, and then we can pass some options to it. In this case, we can actually just pass a function directly, and we can show that this is working by saying auto run starts now. And whatever we have inside of this auto run function, if we save this, we'll get auto run. We press enter and it says it's starting now. This is great. This is the first step towards creating your own custom command that can run whatever you want. Now you can imagine, okay, we're going to do this same idea. We're going to bring this back into our part two, where we have this idea of attaching to a buffer. We're going to say we want to run these things. And now what we need to do is we need to prompt for a few things to give us some information. The first one is we want to know, hey, what output buffer should we attach to? So we could say buff number is vim.fn.input. This allows us to just ask the user blocking what buffer you would like to do, buff number. And we can just say like this, chose buff number. This will allow us to see, hey, what did we actually do here? So let's check this out. We run this, we save it. We can now execute auto run. Auto run will now be this new Lua function that we just created. And it's going to say, what buff number would you like? We can say 34 and it'll say that we chose 34. Okay. So that's part one that allows us to get the information we need to know where we're going to output the results of the program. Part two, we need to know what command we're going to run. So we can say vim.fn.input command. And this will give us a command to run. And we'll also need to get the pattern which is vim.fn.input pattern. Okay, so this allows us to call the input function, get each of these three results, and then we'll also need to just do one thing where we actually end up doing vim.split this by space, which will make sure that we get this when we can type go run main.go. Once we have each of these three items, then what we need to do is pass this into our existing function, which is attached to buffer. Now, what's great is we don't actually have to make attached to buffer a global function or required or anything else like that, because Lua can just take the surrounding closure and grab those up values and put them into the function. So in this case, we need to do one other small little trick, which is we need to convert the buff number into an actual number. The way that we do that is just by calling two number on buff number, and then we can just pass in the pattern directly here, and then we can pass in the command. So now what we can do is we can say we'll save this so now when we run auto run we'll be able to say auto run just like this and it says hey what buff number would you do originally we had 34 so we're going to say 34 again i recognize now that i spelled partner instead of partner but what are you going to do and we'll say star.go and then last will be command go run main.go so now whenever i save this file it will continue to execute this file. So now that we're able to easily configure both what kinds of patterns we're going to do, where we want the output to go, and what command to run, let's just show a different example now of instead of just running some Go file, maybe what we want to do is we want to say whenever we save a Go file, I just want to run Go test on this directory. So we can just do almost exactly the same idea as last time, which would be auto run. And then you can say, okay, what buff number would we like to do? Still 34, because that's what I happen to have. What's the pattern that we want to use? Well, that'll be star.go again. And then the command is go test and then this directory. So now when I save this file here, we'll notice that I get a fail of to do. It shows me the output here. And it also says, for some reason, five always does weird stuff. Well, it turns out that my go function uh, says that it'll add two numbers, but when we pass five, it actually multiplies them. So that's why we get this error. If we changed this to just add instead of multiply, like the name suggests, and we write this. Now we only have the one fail, which is just saying that we have an error to do. I just wanted to show you that it's still doing this. If we commented out this line. Now we get okay. So this allows you to do a really, really quick iteration cycle on saving and seeing the results as fast as possible and as they stream in, which I think is great. As a quick aside for the tease for what part three could be if we get 2000 likes on this video, I'm going to show you how we could even extend this idea to be able to do cool stuff like when we save, we get inline diagnostics that we can move between each of these and we could even do something like showing the output of a particular test when it failed in a split and then closing that as we go and in fact if we went back to can add numbers we changed this plus back to a star 
and we went to here, we see that the test failed. We can once again do this and you could imagine adding another command or a key map to open this very quickly. You're able to see only the output for this particular test. So even though we had two tests fail, uh, maybe I'm only interested in actually figuring out this one at this particular time. So if you want to see a video about that, just smash the like. It's just that easy. That's everything we've got for this video. If you're interested in starting to see something like how could we incorporate diagnostics, key maps, additional state saving, and those sort of really complicated things, let me know. Give me a like on the video. That one's going to take quite a bit more time to put together as a video. So I want to make sure that people actually want to see that. Of course, I'll post this code later once we're done with the whole series up on GitHub and you'll be able to see this and look at it and sort of copy it for yourself to do your own things. Leave a comment if you have any other thoughts or anything further in the series. And thanks everyone for hanging out. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'm glad that you're here. Thanks.